paraphrasing the words of an Indian scholar, Ramakrishna, religion ought to be the discipline which touches the conscience and helps us to struggle with evil and sordidness, saves us from greed, lust and hatred, releases moral power and imparts courage in the enterprise of saving the world. Now I do not imagine there to be anyone here present who would, present who would disagree with the fundamental premise of this quotation, or with the prospect of a world in which all may belong unconditionally, and all may flourish and know freedom accordingly. <coughs> a world where none would ever seek or be enabled to dominate unjustly. A world where all of God's creation is nurtured and sustained as a world. Equally though, I do not imagine there is anyone here who would not from time to time, or more often, for good reason, shake their head in dismay and say, yeah, right. The substantive, empowering, compassionate, enlightened, inclusive, divinely inspired rhetoric of all faith communities is indeed superb. But what about the extent reality of leaders, of individuals, and of enclaves within those communities acting as harbingers and exponents of racism, sexism, homophobia, greed, child abuse, violence, and hatred. And you're not wrong. The evidence is out there in the community. And then we dare to wonder why young, disaffected, barbarically inclined malcontents are abroad in our communities, spewing their unconstrained, hateful manifestos, as in our own recent unspeakably horrific experience, acting out their murderous rage against a completely innocent religious community. As some of you know, and I think as Richard has now made clear, my life's work has been in theological education. And that work for me was both a source of unspeakable joy, of unimagined professional satisfaction, but more often than not, it was one of exasperated outrage. I came completely inadvertently into the Theological Academy. However, once inside, thanks to the unerring total war support of, of Fano, together with the extraordinary encouragement I received from the very few radical thinking, social, political, environmental, economic, feminist, activist theologians who were also my teachers, I knew instinctively that in spite of, and likely also because of, my ostensibly perverse presence, as the only lay, indigenous, divorced woman in, in both the key theological educational leadership role as the dean, and inside an elitist old guard bastion of white male privilege, St. John's College, that I had a significant redemptive challenge to rise to. During my entire tenure, I struggled relentlessly in this elitist, patriarchally bound institution. I struggled as a theological educator, as a faith-filled Anglican activist, to persuade my colleagues, my governing body, the whole church, that their traditionally, unapologetically, Eurocentric means of devising, delivering, and validating theological education was systemically and culturally outdated, outmoded, unjust. I insisted ad nauseum that their collective failure to recognize the monumental insufficiencies within their epistemological assumptions, institutional structures, and skewed geographical frames of reference rendered us all complicit with the insidious oppressions of colonial imperialism. I insisted ad nauseum that as self-respecting 21st century post-colonial Christians and theological educators, we ought to be the first to be capable of articulating with faith-based confidence our understanding of how all elaborations of knowledge, including theological knowledge, always reflect 
dominant power interests. Following on from this, we ought also to have been the first to adopt scholarly practices committed to equitable and mutually beneficial forms of collaboration with subaltern individuals and communities. How else would the long-standing Eurocentric hegemony so deeply entrenched in curricular pedagogy assessment and accrediting ever be disrupted, exposed, then either set aside or at the very least radically transformed? For good measure, I suggested, ever so politely, that I thought the primary focus of theological education ought not to be abstract theorising about the meaning of God, the history of the Church, the person of Christ, the complexity of biblical studies, but should also and predominantly be about a search for peace with justice, for liberation and human transformation in the face of brutally dehumanising forms of oppression, and of massively increased human suffering in the world. It seemed self-evident to me <laughs> that surely, of all the academic disciplines, with its unassailable literary franchise on all the good words, justice, freedom, liberation, equality, compassion, mercy, truth, and so on, that theology in the hands of faithful activist theologians ought to be opened to the post-colonial task of re-examining its hegemonic North Atlantic dominated intellectual tradition, one so uncritically perpetuated within the, the, the educational systems of both the old and the new empires. Over the years I taught not only at St John's but subsequently in ecumenical theological colleges and universities in many parts of the world. Surely I figured Someone, somewhere, would be concerned to critically address the colonial biases of their in, in, institutional base in order to become more appropriately polyvocal, receptive to and empowering of global cultures and epistemologies, and in this way give abundant light and enduring strength to the possibilities inherent in the title of this lecture, which I call Patu Tehe Tiranamari. I was wrong. Oh, so wrong. After 25 years of valiant struggle, I can confidently report that certainly theological seminaries, generally speaking, are to the largest extent not open <laughs> to the kind of radical critique I have long been suggesting. I'm still appalled at the extent to which empire, even in supposedly enlightened post-colonial institutions of high learning, continues to render traditional theological and its close ally religious education, so bereft of context, validity, creativity, relevance, or transformative power. It's still extremely rare to find leaders prepared to radically disrupt the received traditions of their teaching institutions, especially since most who dare end up, as I did, bullied out of the business. And yes, politically, it is to do with the empire and hegemonies, domination and oppression, patriarchy and imperialism. But all of these structural and attitudinal injustices are also increasingly finding expression in the personal. So as a result, in today's completely skewed moral universe, even the personal within religious and other teaching institutions has so ironically also become devoid of decency, kindness, courage, empathy, indeed often of faith-filled love. The pain of recognising my wrongness, far from deterring me, has only increased my determination to continue agitating, to continue searching for ways of redeeming my beloved academic field, my beloved academic profession, and my beloved academic institutions. Just like Atticus Finch in the Huckabee's <coughs> enduring novel To Kill a Mockingbird, I figured that although I may be licked before I begin, I'm going to begin anyway and see it through no matter what. So what might com comprehensively inclusive, culturally expansive, contextually embedded, justice-seeking theological and or religious education for the 21st century world? Before I answer, I do not claim to have, 
but I do not claim to have the definitive response to the question. And right here, I just first need to announce my own caveat. I am only speaking here of Christian-based religious theological education, as this is taught both within seminaries and universities such as this. I do not, I would not ever presume to speak for others who teach within the uh, Abrahamic faith traditions, even as I know there are increasingly concerned and critical voices, especially those of women emanating from within both Jewish and Islamic religious schools, voices rightly and courageously also seeking for inclusion, recognition and affirmation. I think one of the first things that an effective religious educator needs is what I describe as a transcendent imagination. Or in other words, the capacity and the will to transcend things the way they are. A determination to refuse to see history as simply what took place, but rather to see it also as what all people, irrespective of their particular context, are now in the process of making and therefore requiring new responses to. This posture enables an instinctive ability to stop trying to normalise the present and to stop seeing the future as a fait accompli. Both views negate the extraordinary political agency of real people and both therefore lack in any real sense of transformative power. Faith-filled human beings are far from impotent we have both freedom and obligation to act and think in new ways. As faithful human beings of immeasurable God-given agency, we have both the responsibility and the faith-based mandate to transform what is currently inequitable and thus unjust.